For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, with a hello to our viewers and readers in Texas, who I went to grad school, I might add. Thanks to Glynn in Colorado for the monthly pledge. And special acknowledgement to the reader who wrote, My guffawing on reading the news roundup brought my husband and son running and put us all in such a great mood, we decided to celebrate with lunch at our favorite pub. Now, some might say that if climate policy is your idea of a good time, you urgently need a new hobby. But for our part, we're delighted to be entertaining as well as informative. We know you have many other things you could be doing with your time, and we're very much of the view, with G.K. Chesterton, that the opposite of funny isn't serious, it's not funny, and nothing else. Which naturally brings me to the climate crisis involving elephant ears. Yes, folks, from the bottom of the climate barrel comes a plaintive cry, quote, climate change could see elephants' ears grow larger as animals shapeshift to survive, study suggests, end quote. It's not immediately obvious that bigger elephant ears is an existential crisis along the lines of California's coast being under three feet of water in 30 years. But it's also not immediately obvious that it's good science, because evolution is a pretty gradual process, especially if you're an elephant. Those things live up to 70 years, they gestate for two. So exactly how long has the planet been heating to force animals to shapeshift? Because if it's less than, say, 50 years, we're not buying this new flappier elephant. And if it's more, we're not buying human CO2 did it. Now, by the way, because people are forever jeering that global warming skeptics aren't climate scientists, we would like to trumpet that the author of this story has a bachelor's degree in music, and he boasts a full UK driver's license. So, if he can have an opinion, so can we. And our opinion is that Allen's rule, that creatures in warmer places have bigger ears, beaks, tails, and so on to dissipate heat, was formulated back in 1877 because this sort of adaptation has been going on for a long time. If you doubt me, ask a Dimetrodon. But if it has, then the present situation, far from being unprecedented, is old news. And in fact, the study says so. Quote, Australian parrots have shown on average a 4% to 10% increase in bill surface area since 1871, end quote. Okay, so did humans start warming the planet in 1871? Or is the whole thing a nose stretcher? And how about the CBC announcing that invasive earthworms are remaking our forests and climate scientists are worried? Worried about worms eating forests? Yep. From an author with a BA in journalism from Concordia with a minor in women's studies, news of another study that the three-century-long creep of non-native earthworms through North America is releasing deadly clouds of CO2. But once again, if worms can destroy the planet, it wasn't going to make it anyway. Especially since, it seems, they were here until the last glaciation, another piece of dramatic natural climate change. It wiped them out in parts of North America, but now they're back. We might also ask why the last glaciation killed them off, but not the roughly 16 others during the Pleistocene, and why they didn't eat up all the forests way back when, triggering runaway warming. But as a friend of mine likes to say, when you're arguing with a fool, make sure they aren't too. The news letter also notes that the much-hyped 26th Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change seems to be collapsing into woke farce. And we ask again, if, as they claim, they all know exactly what's happening and what to do about it, why do they need to have even a virtual conference, let alone an actual one? Why not stay home and do the hard work, like uh, getting China to cut emissions instead of uttering crude threats if you dare raise the issue? Oh well. If COP26 collapses, at least they won't have to figure out whether to invite the Taliban, who are now proud owners of one of the world's largest lithium deposits. And now, a word from our sponsor. And that's you. Because at the Climate Discussion Nexus, we're dependent upon support from our viewers and our readers. Please go to our donate page, make a one-time pledge, or if you can, a monthly one. I'm not talking a lot of money, though. If you've got it, we'll take it. $2 a month, $3, $5. That's the sustaining funding that we need to produce these videos on our newsletter. And now, back to me. And speaking of hard work, President Biden's Energy Department just announced that the United States should get nearly half its power from solar by 2050. Yeah, and the other half from unicorns. But the New York Times, in reporting, cheering for this announcement, conceded up front that, quote, the department's analysis provides only a broad outline, and many of the details will be decided by congressional lawmakers, end quote. Unless they're not. 
Because if anyone knew what the details were in a workable plan, they'd have told us long ago, including the U.S. Energy Department. The Times story claimed that, quote, the Biden administration on Wednesday released a blueprint showing how the nation could move toward producing almost half of its electricity from the sun by 2050, a potentially big step forward fight fighting climate change, but one that would require vast upgrades to the electric grid, end quote. We say block that metaphor, because without details it's not a blueprint, it's a fantasy, as are those upgrades to the grid, and the hundreds of offshore wind turbines and the gigatons of minerals it would all require, and the 50% of new cars being electric by 2030, and the lithium for their highly combustible batteries, and the, quote, trillions of dollars in investments by homeowners, businesses, and the government, end quote. Yep, math is harsh sometimes. A piece in The Conversation, whose slogan is academic rigor, journalistic flair, just hyped the sexy new attribution science that claims to be able to connect specific weather events to climate change even though you can't. And then they cite what's apparently a shiny example of this breakthrough, the European floods, and say, quote, that a team of climate scientists found that human-induced climate change made a storm of that severity between 1.2 and 9 times more likely than it would have been in a world 1.2 degrees Celsius, 2.1 degrees Fahrenheit cooler, end quote. People, if you don't know whether it's 1.2 or 9 times more likely that you will roll a 7 before rolling another 6 and making your point, you must not go to Las Vegas. You could instead go to Hearst Castle, which we're told, quote, stood for centuries, climate change is prompting its collapse, end quote. Except it turns out that the castle dates to 1544, but the collapsed part was Victorian and was built on a shingle spit directly exposed to the pounding ocean, especially after humans removed its beach protection as part of coastal development. And what's especially silly in this story is that the Washington Post claimed that, quote, historically the British weather is grey but relatively benign. Now there are frequent violent downpours, real gully washers, a month's worth of precipitation in a day, end quote. Okay then, what was Daniel Defoe on about with The Storm, his account of the benign breeze and drizzle in late 1703 that sank a fifth of the British Navy and left Portsmouth and other coastal towns looking, quote, as if the enemy had sacked them and were most miserably torn to pieces, end quote. And if you've got Google Maps on your computer, you can readily determine that Portsmouth is fully 30 kilometers from Hearst Castle. Pity that journalist didn't. Or check that the nearest tide gauge to the castle is indeed at Portsmouth, and shows a long-term increase in sea level of 1.84 millimeters a year, but that it almost ended in 1980, with no visible trend over the last 40 years. So much for climate change causing it. The newsletter also brings the last installment of University of Guelph professor Ross McKittrick's look at Stephen Coonan's landmark book, Unsettled, in which McKittrick quotes Coonan from the last chapter that, quote, I began by believing that we were in a race to save the planet from catastrophe. Since then, I've evolved to become a public critic of how the science of climate science is presented, end quote. And since he also realized that the standard plans to cut greenhouse gas emissions were just not practical, he looked into alternatives like geoengineering and adaptation. And as always, he found that rigid orthodoxies were getting in the way of serious open debate. He also found that geoengineering didn't look promising. Trying to change the reflectivity of the Earth's surface by painting roofs white and stuff, the idea being to bounce away sunlight and reduce warming, is just not practical on a significant scale. As for injecting aerosols into the stratosphere to shade the surface, it's a temporary fix. And, I would add, since we don't really understand climate, we can't predict what unanticipated consequences it might have. It could make things worse instead. Kunin goes on that, as for the idea of sucking carbon dioxide out of the air with a machine, since trees apparently do it too slowly, the problem is we can't bury it deep enough in large enough quantities, and we certainly can't build enough tanks to store it. Of course, you never know what someone might invent, but... Unfortunately, Kunin also realized that the last thing politicians and activists want is an inexpensive, effective strategy that neutralizes the effects of carbon dioxide and lets the world carry on using fossil fuels. They're not even pro-nuclear, for goodness sake. So, Kunin says, what if we just cope instead? He says it's the simplest, most effective, and cheapest response. And he mentions that he lived in Pasadena, California, while teaching at Caltech, and everyone there lived with the reality of constant earthquakes, mostly small, but occasionally big. What they did was they hardened existing infrastructure, and they maintained readiness in case a big one hit. Adaptation to climate change, among other things, is flexible, depending what's happening in any given place, and can be adopted incrementally by people with intimate knowledge of local conditions. But, Kunin says as his final thought, 
institutions have failed us with regard to communicating climate science, and too many individual scientists have been silent as it happened. So, we wrap up by saying you should really consider reading the book. The newsletter also continues our look at what the latest IPCC report really said, in this case about tropical cyclones. And, in case you've had all the tofu you can stand, we bring another study via co2science.org, but this week it demonstrates that carbon dioxide is good for tomatoes, even helping them cope with excessive heat. It really does feel like a pattern, doesn't it? So, as always, share, subscribe, and support, and relax in the shade of the spreading elephant ears. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson.